Praise the Lord, everybody. Well, shake hands with someone around you and tell them that you're good to see them in church today. Can you do that? Amen. Remain standing for just a moment. I'm going to read my Bible text to you, but I enjoyed that set of songs. That takes me back old time. I remember, remember that song, It's All Been Him? I remember uh, Sam and Mark, they loved that song at Stewartsville. They thought it was all Indians, and they, they were into cowboy and Indian stuff, and they thought that was great. And I like that when the battle's over. Amen. I was at a wedding one time, and it was an old-time Pentecostal church, and when, the, when they said the final vows, they struck up a hymn, and it was, when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. <laughs> oh, did you get the hint? Okay. I'm not good at telling jokes, so maybe you get that. All right. That's a Wednesday joke. I tell it Saturday, you get it on Wednesday. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, I'm going to talk to you some stories today. I'm going to tell you some stories. In fact, uh, don't, don't get, that's not a lie. Stories are parables. Jesus spoke in parables. When I first went to the Stewartsville Church back in the 1970s, Sister Haynes, that was Brother Steve's grandmother and Sister Darla's grandmother. What a wonderful person she was. And I, I told a lot of stories, and she just loved that. She said, you know, that's what Jesus did. He talked in parables. I like it. So hope you like it today, because I'm going to tell you some stories. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Shall we say amen to the word of God? Amen. And you may be seated. What the Apostle Paul is saying here in deep in the New Testament, he's saying that the Old Testament, the things that the prophets and the, and the, the kings and the old timers happened to them, they were examples for us in the end time. He was saying that was old out of the law, those things happened, but they just weren't stories. They weren't fairy tales. They weren't just fantasies. They actually happened and were recorded for us today because they are for our admonition. They were examples to us. So I'm going to talk to you about three kings. I'm going to tell you stories about the kings, and I hope that you get some admonition because we are in the end times and we can look back to the Old Testament and take these examples for our admonition. I want to talk to you first about a man named Saul. Everyone say Saul. Saul was not born a king. Thank God that we can be born a second time. And aren't you thankful you weren't stuck in your first birth? Aren't you thankful that there was a leap forward? There was that advancement. So when Saul was born, he was a, a farmer's boy. In fact, the narrative picks up that Israel wanted a king, and God had given them judges, and that worked pretty good. I mean, God spoke directly to judges, and they led Israel. But Israel looked around and saw other nations, and they had kings, so they said, we'd like to have a king too. It escapes me why that people want a king. In fact, does it make sense to you in Great Britain? We have all these princes and princesses and queen and dukes. They live in mansions. They live in castles. Sister Anna, you've seen Buckingham Palace. I've seen Buckingham Palace in, in London. It is marvelous. And these people receive millions of dollars every year from the taxpayers. They don't do nothing but just what kings and queens and princes and dukes do. Dress up nice and cut ribbons and sit on the throne and look important. And yet the people in London and England, they like us. They say, they represent us. We're proud of our king. I don't understand that, but they did. And back in the Bible time, the same thing happened. God was speaking through judges, and that wasn't good enough. We, we want a king. We want somebody to represent us. We want somebody we can look up to, and we, we are his subjects, and we want a king. No, God's ways best. When man gets involved, he messes things up. So God said, I'm going to give you a king. So he gave him a king. But Saul was not born in a royal lineage. He was a farmer's son. And, and when Samuel went looking for, and number one, I think probably Samuel felt a little bit hurt because he was a good judge. And they, they want something beyond me. So, okay. 
So Samuel didn't have a pout and getting up. You know, pouting is a terrible thing. If there's any, if there's any pouters here today, get over it. It don't make things better. It makes you look bad. It makes people around you feel bad. Pouting's a bad thing. I just wish we would, everybody would get over pouting. So Samuel didn't pout. He, he could have. He said, well, here I've been a faithful judge, and they want a, somebody else. Nobody did. God said, go find me a king. So Samuel went looking for one. And the Lord led him to a boy that was, you know what Saul was doing? He was looking for his father's donkeys. His father's donkeys had gotten loose, and he said, Saul, go find my donkeys. Now, I grew up on a farm, and when you're on a farm, sometimes the fences go down, and the cows get out, and the hogs get out, and Dad would say, go find the cows. I've done it many times. He said, I think they're over on Ari Woodruff's farm. I think they went through the gap down at the creek. The, the water washed it out. I think they're over on Kiefer's farm. So I would take off. I go find the cows. Now, back then, we call cows, suck, so, suck, so, so. That sounded ridiculous. That was a cow call. And what we call pigs, boy, pig, boy, boy, boy. And they'd come running. Now, how smart do you have to be to do that? I mean, how smart do you have to be to say, suck, so, boy, pig. I mean, a caveman can do that. I would do that here. They would come. It doesn't take a great IQ. And that was the man that God said, I want to make king. So when Samuel found Saul, he was looking for his father's donkey. But something happened. Samuel laid hands on him and anointed him. And instantly, Saul became a new man. You know what he did? The Bible said he began to prophesy. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he prophesied. I'm telling you, if God can take a young man looking for his father's donkeys and change him to make a king by laying on of hands, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied. And the Bible tells me that Saul stood head and shoulders among all the other men. Evidently, he had a, he had a, a, a tall countenance, but it was not only talking about physical countenance. There was a spiritual aura around him. There was an anointing. He stood head and shoulders. He was favored of God. He prophesied. The Spirit of God was upon him. But something happened to Saul. He became arrogant. He became proud. God hates a proud look and a haughty spirit. Pastor and I were talking last night. It wasn't gossip, but we were talking about someone we know, a bishop, that that boast about his new expensive cars and pictures on Facebook of his new suits. And I see some of these guys on Facebook, they have a picture and they, and they have their hand on the chin. You can see the Rolex watch and their big, big um, cufflinks. And they boast about their vacation in the Caymans. I don't care about their vacation in the Caymans. There is pride. Pride cometh before fall. God hates pride. And Saul became proud. And it became all about him. And one day the Lord told Saul, I, I want you to clean up the Amalekites. They're bad people. I, I, I'm tired of them. They're idolaters. They're murderous. They're wicked. I want, all right, I want to judge them. I want you to take Israel's army and destroy them. Everything. I don't want nothing left of them. You know, that time comes. If you look in history, all through history, God judges. If God does not judge America for its sin, he'd have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, can you imagine abortion, incest, pornography, drugs, atheism, riots, murders, Everything, their every thought is on evil content, as it was in the days of America. Now, this just popped up last night in my uh, notices. Somebody, I don't know who it was, it was a video of a big party. And the party, when I saw this video, I thought, my God, we've crossed the line America has. 
This was not Hollywood set. It was not um, uh, uh, people with dyed hair and nose rings. It was a big party. People looked like us. There were people there, some with baseball caps, and there were grandma types, and there was husbands and wives. They weren't dressed up in tuxedos. They were just good old common Americans at a party. But guess what their entertainment was? Uh, transgenders. Men dressed up like women. And I'm embarrassed to tell you what they looked like. Shaking their booties. Getting, doing lap dances. Bikinis. But you tell they weren't women. They were men. And people sticking dollar bills in their bikini panties. And in their bikini bras. And laughing. I thought, this is not Hollywood. This is just good old middle class America. America has crossed the tipping point, folks. Trust me. Well, we already see it. Pestilence. Th this coronavirus is worse today in India, in Bangladesh, in, in parts of the world than it's ever been. It's not going away. We need, God is talking to the world today. Judgment is coming. And it happens when people break God's law, and this man Saul went too far, and God was going to judge the people of the Amalekites, and Samuel sent him forth with the directions from God, and when they came back from battle, Samuel went out to <clears throat> meet Israel. He saw Saul coming back, and he was so happy to see him, but he heard something didn't sound right. He heard the mooing of cows. He heard the bleeding of sheep, and he looked a little bit closer. He saw livestock coming, and he saw Saul leading a man with a, a rope around his neck, and he went out and said, who is this? And Saul said, I'm bringing back Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And look at this. I'm bringing back their best cows and their best sheep. And, and, and Samuel said to Saul, he said, God told you to destroy them. But Saul said, I, will, I want to bring Agag back because I conquered the king. I want, to, I want to show the people what I've done. And I'm going to bring back their cattle and their sheep to make our flocks better. And Samuel went off and prayed. And God said, my spirit has departed from Saul. He said, don't pray for him. I'm through with him. Yeah. Folks, I've seen too many people that have crossed the line. We need a healthy fear of God today. God, the Bible says, grieve, the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. That's why it is a pleasure to come to the house of God. It's a pleasure to lift our hands. It's a pleasure to pray. It's a pleasure to testify. It's a pleasure to sing. Don't let your heart grow cold. If Saul, anointed by God, could grow so cold, he would disobey the Lord and do something like that. It could happen to us. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm going to talk to you about another king now. And, and God moved his pleasure away from Saul. And God sent Samuel to find another king. And he went to the household of Jesse. He said, I'm here to find a king to take Saul's place. And Jesse brought his first son and said, this is my eldest son. And Sam said, not this one. He went seven deep till he found David. God overlooked, Samuel, by let of God, overlooked the obvious. Aren't you thankful? God takes who he chooses. Not the obvious, but you know, today we're not millionaires. We're common people. But God has looked beyond the obvious and touched us. Here we sit in heavenly place. Aren't you thankful for that? And when the Lord anointed David to become king, it was 17 years before he actually sat on the throne. David was not impatient. Years later, when Saul was trying to kill David, and David had the chance to kill Saul first, he said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed nor do his prophets harm. He respected God's will. I'm waiting, I'm ready, but it's not God's will yet. And I'm not going to kill somebody to move myself to the other line. You know, sometimes even saints in the church want, want elevation. And sometimes they'll step on somebody else to get that position, to get that recognition. Don't seek recognition. Don't ever step on somebody else. If you have to climb over somebody 
to get the top. It's not worth it. David was willing to wait my turn. I don't understand it. God anointed me. Saul's backslid. He's doing bad things, but I'm not going to take it in my hands. I'm going to leave it to God. And finally, it was time. But between that being anointed and his time, remember when the children of Israel, led by Saul, was fighting the Philistines, and, and, and no one could, could defeat Goliath, Samuel's, David's father sent David to go to the battlefield to take food to his brothers who were in Saul's army. And when he got there, here, I'm anointed. I'm not king yet, but I'm going to do something between now and then. We haven't gone to heaven yet, but I'm not sitting and waiting to my elevation. I'm not going to sit and wait till he says, well done. I'm not going to sit and wait till I walk on streets of gold. I'm going to do my best here. David could said, now I am king and waiting. And I brought my brother's food. And Saul can take care of that Goliath or somebody else. I might get hurt. I'm going to be king someday. I'm not going to take a chance. David said, I'll go out. And when Saul offered David his helmet and his sword, and his, he said, no, I'm going to go in the name of the Lord. You see, David had already proven God because you know the story? When a bear came against his father's flock, he slew the bear. When a lion came against his father's flock, he slew the You know, he could have said, I have been touched by the Lord. I'm going to be king someday. I'm not going to fight that lion. My dad's got lots of lambs. Let him eat. We can lose a lamb. I might get hurt. I might get scratched. I might get an infection. <laughs> I'm not going to fight that lion. I'm going to wait till I become king. None of us are too big to do little things. Come on, son. B -b -b Brother Luke told it last week in the, in the Bible class or this morning sermon or maybe it was sometime in between about a couple, few years ago. Bishop Teclamarium, the, the founder of the apostolic work in Ethiopia some 60 years ago, today presides over five and a half million was at our conference, and when Pastor Luke asked between services, can I have some men help me move chairs? And when they said, hey, man, the young men, boom. I mean, it was like turning the lights on and roaches leaving. I mean, the young men were gone. And Brother Teclamarium stooped, suffering Parkinson's, walks to Pastor Luke and offers to help. When I've gone to Ethiopia several times, He's met me at the airport. Here I am, five foot eleven. He's about five foot four. I'm healthy. He's probably weighs 130 pounds, suffering Parkinson's. When he meets me at the airport, he'll fight me for my suitcases. He will not. There he is carrying my suitcases. I say, please, Bishop, no. You're my guest. He carries my suitcases. He could say, Well, I am presiding over five and a half million people. I'm not carrying your suitcases. Submit yourself. When Jesus came, when God manifested himself in the flesh, when he chose to come to the world, how did he come? As a servant. In fact, that's why the Jews ultimately rejected him. You are a man claiming to be God? <laughs> I know you came out of Joseph's house. I've seen you planing wood and hammering nails, and you are the Messiah, get real. He fooled them. He came as a servant. So David did the small things, and he became king. In fact, in fact, he, he, was, so, he was such a, a good warrior and such a great king. When the, when the young ladies of Israel sang, they would say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. They love Saul, but my, this David, he's a superman. And Saul became jealous. He tried to kill David. And David didn't fight back. He didn't fight back. He didn't fight back. 99% of church troubles are people fighting back, getting even. We, back when I was pastoring in Stewartsville years and years ago, 
Yonkers, the uh, farm implement company, would give us free, or put on loan, we got one new every year, a mower. And had this brand new snapper mower. I had two men in the church that would fight over who got to mow the yard. And that was a good thing. Somebody got to mow the yard, the yard got mowed, but why fight over it? And they, one would come at 11 o'clock on Saturday, the next guy would come at 10. The next guy would come at 9. The next guy would come at 8. And then he would hide the key. And then the other guy would, would, would uh, what do they do it? Would cut the wires and hot, hot wire it. Finally, they put on gloves and had a fight. Who got to mow the yard? Come on, somebody, be real. David was not that man. David was a good man. He was a godly man. He was a, a man after God's own heart. But then one day, he got older. And the Bible says the kings went out to war. It was a time of warfare. Folks, are we living in warfare today? Yes. Does anybody sense spiritual warfare in our world today? If you, if you don't sense spiritual warfare in our world today, you're sleeping. Watch the news. Read the newspaper. Feel something. You can feel in the air. There's a pestilence. There is a confusion. Watch, watch the news. Things don't make sense anymore. I mean, what's happening doesn't make sense. We had the best economy ever. Now they're talking about shutting down the pipeline, stopping drilling for oil. China's drilling for oil. Russia's drilling for oil. Iran's drilling for oil. We're supposed to go green. you got to get rid of your car and buy an electric car worth $50,000. Can we afford that? What about our houses? We have to board up our windows and put solar panels on top of it? Come on, somebody, be real. We're wrecking that everything doesn't make sense anymore. And, and, and the Bible says the kings were going out to war. There was warfare. But what did David do? David, the man after God's own heart, who had killed the lion with his bare hands, killed the bear with his lion hands. <clears throat> we'll see if you caught that. David, who killed Goliath when nobody else would fight him. This man after God's own heart. Yet, when the kings went to war, David had reached the point well, I've fought my battles. I've killed the tens of thousands. I killed Goliath. I killed the bear. I killed the lion. I think I'm going to stay home and watch a movie. <laughs> I think I'm going to go to Rafferty's. I think I'm going to go to Santa Claus land. I think I'm going to go to the lake. I, I think I'll go golfing today. Let, let somebody else fight. Folks, until the Bible says the summer is past, the harvest is ended, and we're not yet saved. Used to be an old man in the church of Stewartsville, Brother Gentry. Remember him, Brother Gentry? He would say, until the gates clink behind us, we've not made it to heaven. Until we walk through the glorious gates of heaven and they clink behind us, we've not got it made. Take heed lest you, when you think you stand, lest you fall. Stay on your guard. You've not got it made yet. You, you, you may have done great things in the past, but what have you done for God now? God looks back and gives you favor, but don't grow cold. Don't be lukewarm, because that's when the devil slips in. And when David decided, I've let somebody else go fight, I'm staying home. He was up, it was hot. He was up in his palace roof. He's looking around over yonder. Well, we're a mixed crowd today. Let's say it quickly. Cover the baby's ears. <laughs> he saw a naked woman bathing. He should have turned away. But he oogled. He lusted. He called for her. He was a king. Of course she came. They committed sin. She became a child. He was in trouble. But he wanted to blame it on her husband. So her husband, thank God, was out fighting like he ought to have been. He brought Uzziah back and said, go to your wife. But Uzziah, think about this man. He went to his house, but he slept on the doorpost, on, on, the, on, the, on the doormat in the front of the house. He would not go into his wife because he said, I cannot eat and drink in my house and sleep with my wife when my men are out fighting. What a man of character he was. Uzziah was a good man. And David killed him. He killed him. He sent him back to the battlefield and told his commander, send Uzziah to the front of the line where the battle's the thickest, then back up. 
let him kill him. What a hard-hearted thing. It's surprising what people can do that once had the Holy Ghost. It's surprising what people can, that's why I'm trying to tell you, thank God you repented. Thank God you got baptized in Jesus' name. Thank God you got the Holy Ghost. Thank God you prayed for the sick. Thank God you speak in tongues. Thank God you've seen miracles happen. But until the rapture takes place, until we walk on the streets of gold, we are not finished yet. If you become lukewarm, if you become cold, if you become lax, Little old fox will spoil the vines. Stop praying as much. Stop attending church as much. Start finding fault. Start pouting. Start getting competition with your brothers. How come he got honor and I didn't get honor? These little things mount up, and finally, you'll be surprised what the devil put in front of your eyes. And you may be surprised what you'll fall for. As I've said before, all the devil's apples have got worms in them. All of them. The bad thing is, after he committed adultery, after he killed an innocent man, he didn't feel bad about it. He went right on like his conscience was seared. Oh, God, give us such conviction today in all of our services that God gets beyond the seared consciences. We're living in a time today that people have gotten so deep in sin, their hearts are hard. I mean, you can preach hell hot, heaven high, God good, the devil bad, miracles can take place, and people's hearts are so hard, they'll sit there and say, that's nice, that's nice. But, but they don't change. We need conviction where people change. Come on. We, I, oh, God, God. I, I remember the old days where conviction was so strong in the church, people would grip the pew in front of them. We call it the white knuckles. Such conviction they would and they finally would break out and run the altar. I've seen them run and skid on their knees and, and be tears coming down their face asking God to forgive them. But today there's such hardness of heart. You know it's the truth. America's hearts are hardened. People walk in our church with hard hearts. God give us people with a tender heart. Amen. David's heart was hardened. But God knows how to break it. A year passed. He sent the prophet Nathan. And Nathan walked in the king's room and began to rebuke David. But to David's credit, and I'm going to give David credit for this, he didn't kick him out. Whereas Saul tried to kill Samuel. Whereas Saul did kill prophets. At least David gave the prophet a hearing. Oh, whether it's Pastor Luke, whether it's me, Brother, Brother Allen, whether it's Brother Meredith, whoever God puts in this pulpit to preach to you, honor it. Yes. Listen to it. Yes. God's given them something for me. We can't harden a heart. We can't daydream. Lord, speak to me. David still, in spite of his hardness of heart, there was still a place where he respected the prophet of God. Yes. And the prophet told him a story. I'm telling you a story today. The prophet told Nathan a story. I mean, Nathan the prophet told David a story. He said, there once was a man that had many sheep. And there was a man that had one sheep. And the man with many sheep came and took the man who had one sheep, his sheep away from him. And he killed it and left him with nothing. And David said, you, 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 put, you that put that evil man, evil to, man death, to death. And you restored, and you restored that, poor, that poor, man, poor man fourfold. fourfold. And Nathan, and Nathan said, said Thou art the man. Uzziah had nothing but one wife. You had wives and concubines. You were the king, and you took all he had, and then you killed him. You're the man. And what did Nate, What did David say? David said, "Well, it wasn't my fault. She shouldn't have been. She should have. She should have. She should have had something, had something on. on. Hey, it, it wasn't, wasn't my, fault. my fault. She shouldn't she have come, over to, come over to my house." Well, you well, should have slept, slept, with, slept her. with her. David, David did not did make, not make excuses. Come on, somebody. I'm sick and tired of excuses. What did David do? He shot up and said, Oh, God, forgive me. I have sinned against thee. Give me a clean heart and restore unto me a right spirit. Amen. And God forgave him. And today, Jerusalem is called the city of David. 
And when Jesus comes back one day, he will sit on the throne of David. And 700 years after David's repentance, God chose the lineage of David to manifest himself in the flesh. Jesus is the root and the offspring of David. He is David's God, manifested through his loins and became the fruit of David. Can somebody say amen? amen. What a forgiving God we have. I think time permits me to talk about one more. His name is Solomon. Solomon, the son of David. In fact, I, I, I read the book of Proverbs just recently, and I read both the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the last month. Read them for you sometime. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the wisdom, the instruction, it is powerful, it is awesome, it is incredible, it is unbelievable. It is incredible and unbelievable. Yet, Solomon backslid. He brought in wives from other countries, and they brought the religion with them. And he built temples and shrines to their, to their gods. And Solomon backslid. In fact, many of the occult and many of the witches today and the soothsayers, they go back to Solomon for their inspiration. This man totally went off the rails. How can someone, because the Bible says, love not the world. Oh, here I'm going to get on your table now. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. Solomon brought the world into his house. He brought their idols into his house. He brought their worship into his house. We need to learn to turn the dial off, shut the radio off, Stop looking at things. Stop listening. The old timers had it right. Come on, you know what's the truth. The old timers had it right. Touch not the unclean thing. Touch it not. The Lord said, I am your God. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your Savior. I'll receive you unto myself. Holiness is great then. It's great now. We need it. The Bible, Jesus said, pluck it out. Cut it off. Turn your back on it. There's things we cannot see, things we cannot listen to, things we cannot do, places we cannot go. You cannot, you cannot dance with the devil in the pale moonlight and then walk in the sunshine of Jesus. They'll come out from among them and be a separate people and touch not the unclean thing. God said, come out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing. Be a separate people and I will receive you unto myself. I came out of a movement, and many of the men that was in that movement, they went far beyond where I came out of. I, I, I'm as conservative in my doctrine as I've ever been in my life. I believe one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I believe living a holy life. I'm not going to fuss about hair length. I'm not going to fuss about mustaches, beards. I'm not going to talk about stuff like that. <laughs> We're not going to talk about... Uh, we're not going to talk about television and baseball games. We're, we're not going to talk. But one Lord, one faith, one baptism, you must be born again. But some of the men that left that real rigid denomination, today, when they go to the pizza shop, they get a pitcher of beer. I mean, I was preaching for a church a few years ago. We had a marvelous service. And in the afternoon, he said, we're going to go to the movies. You want to go with us? I said, what? I don't think I want to go to the movies with you. There's things in the movie theater we, we, we can't watch. Is this okay? How many want to see the Lord? How many want to see revival? How many want to be used of God? Separate yourself from the unclean thing. If it was wrong 50 years ago to drink and to smoke, and go into places that weren't good. It's wrong today. The bearers have been let down. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. The son of David. Who wrote the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Backslid. Became the forefather of much of the witchcraft in the world today. Because he brought the world into his life. 
I'll repeat that again. Solomon, the son of David, with divine wisdom, he asked God, he said, God, give me a double portion of wisdom. Read the Proverbs. Read Ecclesiastes. It is incredible how this man backslid. And today, witches and witchcraft and the occult go back to Solomon. In fact, the star that they use originated from Solomon. How'd that happen? Because he brought idols and the world into his life. Be careful what you watch. This is not eloquent. This is not oratory excellence. But there's nothing I'm saying can be more important. In the name of Jesus, be careful what you watch, what you hear, where you go, who you fellowship with, what you listen to, what you allow to come in your life. An idol can be more than a statue of Buddha. It can be your car. It can be your house. It can be your garden. When you put these things more important. I should go to church, but I got to plant my tomatoes. Uh, I can't tithe today because I, I spent a lot of money on my car last week. Um, I can't give them the missionary offering because I just bought a new dinette set. Put God first. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. God bless you. Pastor Luke, would you come? Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet with me. Hallelujah. How many enjoyed that class this morning? Give our bishop one more big hand. Give the Lord a hand clap and thank God. Thank God for wisdom. Thank God for the word. Thank God.